Hi, in this video, we're going to continue talking about the toolkit for the course and uh, divert our attention to the doing data science part and specifically uh, focus on the programming aspect of things. So let's start with the learning goals for the course to provide some context for why we're using these tools. By the end of this course, you will be able to gain insight from data. This is one of the learning goals of the course, but we can actually say a bit more and build on this a bit more. Gain insight from data reproducibly, and we're going to talk in a little bit about what I mean by reproducibility. Uh, building on that more, gain insight from data reproducibly using modern programming tools and techniques. And building on that even more, gain insight from data reproducibly and collaboratively using modern programming tools and techniques. And actually, just to make sure that we capture everything that we're doing in this course in this one sentence, I would expand it a bit more and say, gain insight from data reproducibly with litter programming and version control and collaboratively using modern programming tools and techniques. So we're going to hit on all of these bits and pieces of um, things that we've mentioned in these bullet points on this slide with the tools that I'm going to introduce to you in this video and the next one as well. What do I mean by reproducible data analysis though? Think about um, what does it mean for a data analysis to be reproducible? What we mean by that is that in the near term, our goals are to be able to say yes to the following questions. Are the tables and figures reproducible from the code and data? Does the code actually do what you think it does? And in addition to what was done, is it clear why it was done? In the long term, you might be thinking about, can the code that you wrote be used for other data? Or can you extend the code to do other things? Our goal in this course is to be able to get you to a point where you're comfortably and confidently saying yes to the first three questions and perhaps thinking about the next two questions and telling yourself, I think I want to take a few more courses in this domain so that I can get closer to saying yes to those as well. So in terms of our toolkit for reproducibility, we want to do our data analysis in a scripted way. That means that instead of clicking on buttons to say, make a plot of this, fit that model for me in a, a software that has a graphical user interface, we are actually going to be writing code to uh, do our data analysis. And that we're going to get from R. We want to be able to use literate programming. That means our code, narrative, and output is in that one place in that our markdown document. So that's another piece of the reproducibility puzzle. And we want to make sure that our process is documented along the way using version control tools like Git and GitHub. So let's start with R and RStudio. What is the difference between R and RStudio? R is an open source statistical programming language. And it is also an environment for statistical computing and graphics. It's easily extensible with packages. We're not going to be writing any packages in this uh, course ourselves, but you're going to be using a lot of packages. And who knows, maybe uh, soon after that, you might be interested in learning about writing packages and extending the language yourself as well. Our studio, on the other hand, is a convenient interface for R called an IDE that stands for Integrated Development Environment. So you might say sentences like, I write R code in the RStudio IDE. Uh, RStudio is not a requirement for programming with R, but it's very commonly used by R programmers and data scientists, so we're going to be using it as well. So. The next up is R packages. Packages are basically the fundamental units of reproducible R code. They include reusable R functions, the documentation that describes how to use them, and also sample data. And we're going to be using packages and making use of all of these aspects, the functions they uh, bring, the documentation that comes along with them so that we can learn about what those functions do, and also sometimes using sample data from these packages to illustrate some of the concepts that we're learning about. As of September 2020, there are over 16,000 R packages available on CRAN, which is the Comprehensive R Archive Network. So if you ever want to write an R package and you want to distribute it to the rest of the world, that is one way that you can go about doing it, and it's the most commonly used and kind of the official way of doing so. Um, we're going to work with a very small portion of those packages, obviously, uh, but an important subset of those, one that are uh, a subset that is commonly used for doing modern data analysis in R. 
So next we're going to do a tour of r and &R Studio uh, and I have this kind of slide here where I've annotated some of the things that we're going to be uh, looking at but I'd like to actually uh, open r Studio for you and then uh, go ahead and show you what's going on by typing the code one y one and talking through it. So you can come back to this screenshot later to kind of remind yourself what we walk through. So here I am in RStudio Cloud and I've started a new project and I've named it Tour r and Studio. And this is what the RStudio IDE looks like. Um, you can see that by default, the background is all white, so it's in light mode. Um, for my videos, I prefer to keep it in dark mode just because I think it's a little bit jarring to have this white screen while you're watching a video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Tools and then Global Options and appearance, and I'm going to change uh, my um, theme to a dark theme. And let's also make sure that we make the size of the text a little bit larger for you to be able to see as well. And I'm going to hit OK. So if you also prefer to see things in dark mode while you're working, especially if it's late at night or something, you can make the change like this. I also showed you how to change the font size. That might be helpful if you're screen sharing with um, your um, teammates or your classmates um, and actually going through something. Sometimes if the text is a bit larger, it's a lot easier for people to see. Okay, so let's see what's happening in our studio. Here we have the console, and this is basically where the magic happens. So this is where we write the R code um, and where the computation is happening more importantly. We don't always have to be writing the code there, but that's where the computation is happening. So what's the most simple thing you can do in R? Just simple arithmetic. I can say two plus two and I get four. I can do something a little bit more extensive than that. I can create a new object. I'm going to call it X and I'll assign the value two to it using the assignment operator, which is just a less than sign and a dash. And now what I've done is I have an object called X that I can see in my environment and I can see the value of it that's stored as well. Here I'm seeing it on the top right side. Um, if I type X, R reports back to me what that value was and I can do additional arithmetic operations with it like x times 3 gives me 6. This is all great but it is you know basically a calculator still at this point. So uh, we talked about R packages. I can go ahead and load an R package. I would do that with using the library command and I'll say I'd like to load the Palmer penguins package, which basically has some data set on penguins from the Arctic, uh, about 300 or so, I believe. Uh, we're going to come back to that data set again, but for now, I'm just showing you uh, what are the minimal things that you can do once you load an R package. I happen to know that this particular package um, has a data set called penguins, so I can go ahead and open that data set and now I'm seeing the data in kind of like a spreadsheet format as I've shown you before, where every um, row represents one of the penguins. We know their species, we know what island they came from, so on and so forth. Um, and there are 344 of those I can see here at the bottom and eight total columns, meaning that I have eight columns worth of information on them. If I wanted to access one of the columns that's within a data set, I can't just write something like uh, flipper length mm, which is one of the variables I can see in my data set. R is going to tell me I can't find this for you. So what R expects me to do is to first mention the data set that it's in and then use the dollar sign operator to um, say I want a variable from within this data set and um, I can actually, it will be a little bit helpful, the RStudio ID will be a little bit helpful so I don't have to type everything out and I can select that. So now I have basically extracted that information, doesn't look as useful to me here as just a string of numbers, but if I wanted to do something with just the string of numbers, I can actually extract that information out. What might be one thing I might wanna do? I might wanna say, oh, I wonder what's the average flipper length in millimeters for these penguins. Uh, the function that I might use for that is the mean function. And in R, after a function is always parentheses. And then in the parentheses, we uh, put in what we want to find, the what we want to apply the function to. So that would be penguins and then flipper length. Huh. And R tells me NA, 
I clearly couldn't do that. So whenever you get a result where you're thinking, okay, I, I may have done something wrong, this is not working, the first thing you might wanna do is look for some help. And the one place where that you might uh, look for help first is the function documentation. And we can always get to any function or object uh, documentation that is uh, distributed within a package using the question mark. So I can do question mark mean to pop open this help window, but I can also, if I want, go to the help window and type the name. So if I wanted to do it for the median, for example, I could type it and it would show up as well. So let's go back to the mean here and let's see what might be happening. So in the uh, our help here, it says the first argument is X. This is basically an R object that you want to find the mean of. Um, there's an argument called NARM equals false. So what by default the mean function is doing is saying if you have any NAs, um, not available data in, your, um, in what you're trying to find the average of, I'm just not gonna report it for you. I'm going to make you tell me explicitly that you want me to ignore those NAs. And we can see that some of these penguins did not have any flipper lengths recorded. So let's go back and I'm going to click on my up arrow to scroll through uh, function, uh, any code that I had written before. And I'm going to say, okay, let's do NARM equals true then. And now I actually have uh, the uh, average uh, flipper length in millimeters for these uh, penguins. So that was a brief overview of R and R Studio. We're going to spend a lot of time in R and R Studio, and uh, you're going to start by doing that both uh, during the application exercises throughout these videos, and also uh, on the workshop on Friday. So a short list for now of R essentials. So functions are most often verbs, and then they're followed by uh, what they will be applied to in parentheses. So we might say do this to this, a noun, a, fun a verb and then a noun, or I might say do that to this to that with those. So I can have additional arguments that I'm passing on to my function as well. Uh, packages are installed with the install.packages function and you're going to rarely use this function because in our Studio Cloud I would have probably installed any packages that you might need so that when you come in you're ready to start with your analysis uh, but when you're working on your project and also for one of the homework assignments in this class I'm going to ask you you know you're your own boss Go find whatever packages you want to use and use them. And at that point, you're going to need to install the packages once per project. And then every time you're in a new R session, you need to load those packages explicitly with the function library like we did earlier. Um, as I said earlier, when you have a data frame and then a variable in that data frame, we use the dollar sign operator uh, in between those two to access the particular variable. And also object documentation can be accessed with the question mark or using the help menu in our studio. Let's talk a little bit about some of those 16,000 packages that we're going to learn about. So one of them is the tidyverse package and the tidyverse is actually a meta package as in once you load it with library, it brings in a bunch of packages along with it, eight, eight to be precise. So this is an opinionated collection of R packages that are designed for data science. You can see their names in these little hex logos of each one. Um, I think we mentioned so far ggplot2, or at least we've seen some code where that function ggplot was appearing to make data visualization. We're gonna go through the rest of what all of this means. Uh, but importantly for now for you to keep in mind is that we are going to be using the tidyverse suite of packages and that all of these packages share an underlying philosophy and a common grammar which means that once you learn about one of them it beats a little bit easier to learn the next and the next because they behave similarly um, another package we're going to make heavy use of is the R markdown package and R markdown and the various packages that support it basically enable our users to write their code in prose in reproducible computational documents uh, we will generally refer to R Markdown documents. They have that .rmd extension. And instead of loading this package, we'll probably use the words R Markdown, like do this in your R Markdown document, uh, just because as soon as you have that document, basically the loading of that package is implicit. So you can think of this as a tool for 
writing up your data analysis and uh, kind of the structure of your data analysis versus the tidyverse packages are as individual packages that allow you to do certain things with your data. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about our markdown since we're going to spend a lot of time in our markdown documents. These are fully reproducible reports. So each time you knit the, uh, the document, the analysis is ran from the beginning. Um, they use simple markdown syntax for text, and I'm going to show you in a little bit what that means, some simple uh, examples of it. Your code goes in chunks that are defined by these three backticks, and any narrative goes outside of these chunks. Um, so let's go ahead and do a tour of our markdown. Similarly here, I'm going to go back to our studio and open up um, the project for you so that we can actually go through what an R markdown document looks like and talk through different pieces of it. But I have annotated some of that and left it here in the screenshot if you want to refer back to it later. So now I am in RStudio Cloud and I'm going to start by clicking start for the second application exercise. All right, so we're in. So let me go ahead and uh, change the options here again so that we can make this in dark mode and make our text a little bit larger. All right, here we go. So I'm in this application exercise and I have an R Markdown document called Bechtel. And let's go ahead and open that. Um, I don't know if you know what the Bechtel test is, but that's what we're going to be working with today. So this, um, the example analysis that we're going to be working with uh, comes from 538, which is an online publication that does a lot of data-based journalism. And the, um, the title of the article that they published was called The Dollar and Cents Case Against Hollywood's Exclusion of Women. So our task here is to fill in the blanks in this document, but I'm also going to use this as an opportunity to walk you through an R Markdown document and to look at the, um, the uh, example. Uh, 538, whenever they write an article that's based on data, they also tend to release the data for others to use. So I've actually grabbed that data. There is an R package in uh, called 538. So we're starting by loading that package and we're basically going to look at what's happening here. Um, so in terms of collecting the data, what the researchers had done was to look at a bunch of movies. Uh, actually, um, uh, these movies uh, released between, I think, 1970 and 2013, a bunch of movies, and they applied the Bechtel test to them. So um, the movie passes this tech test if women are in the movie and they are talking about anything other than men, basically. So the first thing that you want to do when you open an R Markdown document is to knit it. Um, and what that means is that uh, here we're seeing the source code, but we actually want to see the output. So that you can see the source code and the output side by side, I'm going to click on this gear icon and say that I want to preview my results in the viewer pane. So once again, right here. Um, and then I'm going to knit the document. I'll give it a second while that's running. And I don't need this environment uh, right now, so I'm going to um, expand my uh, output so that we can actually take a uh, look at our result. So in the R Markdown document, on top we have this area called the YAML, which is basically where the metadata about your document goes. So I have the title that's been uh, rendered as large text. So the next thing I might do is I might wanna put in my name. So let me go ahead and do that. And if I was to knit this again, you'll be able to see that that's reflected in these um, kind of uh, fill in the blanks area and that's formatted a particular way as well. Uh, we said that our code goes in code chunks that are denoted by these three backticks and then curly braces. So in these curly braces, we have a few things. The first thing is the letter R, and you always need to have that when you're running R code. Uh, that basically tells the document which engine to use, where, to, uh, which environment to run your code in. 
just as an aside, you can run other types of code in these documents. So if I take a look at how I could insert a new code chunk, we can see uh, names of other languages. These may or may not be familiar to you. Maybe Python might be one that's familiar to many of you. It is a common, another commonly used data science language. And um, so we could actually run chunks that use these other languages as well. But we are, for the purposes of this course, going to be sticking with R. So in our R chunks, we're always going to have uh, the letter R to start with. The next thing is a label for your code chunk. You can type whatever you want in here, but no spaces. Um, and we're going to be asking you to give informative labels for your chunks because you can see that if you do have these informative labels, you can actually see them represented down here in the navigator and it makes it easier to go through your document. So in my opinion, this particular example document is not prepared very well because these particular chunks are missing labels. Um, then you might have other options that you're passing to the chunks. I'm going to not talk about those just yet uh, since they're entirely optional, but we're going to get to talking about them more later. Um, another thing I want to draw your attention to is what's happening in this paragraph. In the source code I'm seeing, the data set contains information on blah. Uh, so in backticks, I have the letter R again and then some other R code. And when I look at the rendered document right up here, I can see that it says the data set contains information on 1794 movies. So that number 1794 is not something I wrote by hand, but instead R calculated for me. So these are called R chunks where we have the three back ticks and they're kind of on their own in a line. And these are called um, inline R chunks. And those are basically denoted by single back ticks and then the letter R and then a space and then whatever code you want to write. You can imagine writing very extensive code in there would be a little cumbersome, but if you're looking for something quick like give me the number of rows in the Bechtel data set, R will actually calculate that for you and uh, add it here. So just as an example, I'm going to say that number plus one. So I have 1794 here. If I was to knit this document, I should expect to see 1795 inserted into my text. And in fact, you can see that we're going to go back and fix that since that's obviously not right. But I wanted to exemplify to you that you can actually write any sort of code that's valid into those inline chunks. And then it's going to get formatted just like the text around it. This is very useful for that goal of reproducibility that we have. You often need to write things like this. And it's so easy to make careless mistakes, especially if you have data that's changing on a daily basis. So to be able to programmatically pull out some of these values that are easy to get out from your data, but also easy for a human to make kind of typos with, um, you're in a much better place in terms of reproducibility. So what I've done here is I've started with the Bechtel data set and I said, I'm just going to look at the years between 1990 and 2013. Now I'm saying I've done this, but I've not even taught you how to do that. I haven't taught you what filter means. I haven't really taught you what this operator is. And I'd like you to kind of glance over that for the time being. We're very much going to be talking a lot about these over the next few weeks. So at this point, we are not asking you to um, write any sort of original R code just yet. We're going to start that next week. But for now, I'm trying to walk you through the structure of the document. But instead of giving you a toy example, I actually wanted to give you an example that might be interesting for you to read about. So I've created a new data set called Bechtel 90 underscore 13. So just the years between 1990 and 2013. And here we have another fill in the blank that you at the end of this video can go back to and think about filling. And so what this fill in the blank is about is it's saying there are blah such movies. So I need some inline code that's going to look at this new data set that I just created and give me the number of rows for that. Hopefully using what we've done earlier for th with the original data set, you might be able to get the answer. Um, so let's uh, keep going and take a look at the output. Another thing we're seeing here is that we have some uh, text that are indicated by bullet points, so like a uh, unordered list here. 
And you can create these lists uh, simply by uh, using um, these uh, dashes. So they will render to um, bullet points. If I was to use numbers for these instead, and you can actually get away with simply repeating the number one because our markdown or the markdown will take care of uh, counting them for you so you don't have to keep track of them. Those would be rendered as one, two, and three. But I'm going to make these go back to um, dashes since it doesn't really make sense to have a numbered list there. Um, another thing we're seeing in the text is that we have some text that is code formatted. So whenever you're referring to a data frames name or a variable name, anything related to R, a function name, it's nice to use this formatting with the back ticks to say, um, I want that formatted a certain way so it's clear that I'm talking about a variable as opposed to something in my prose. You're seeing some uh, bolding here and that can be achieved with the um, two stars. So before and after uh, the whatever phrase you want to bold. And I'd like to show you one more of these, which is um, right over here. Uh, so in this particular exercise, we're looking to see, uh, do movies that, uh, you know, fail the Bechtel test or pass the Bechtel test tend to do better in terms of return on investment? So that's looking at revenue for the, or the gro gross for the uh, movie and the, um, the budget for the movie. So we had some movies that did really, really well in terms of their return on investment. Uh, one of them is one that I personally find very, uh, you know, enjoyable to watch. The Blair Witch Project, it probably predates all of you. It is a very kitschy horror movie, but I still remember it to this day. And I remember what a sensation it was when it, was, when it first came out. But anyway, that's one of the movies that with, um, high return on investment. So when I was writing this text, I actually want to emphasize the very high return on investment. So we have this italicized text here. And to get that, we can use instead of two uh, stars, we can actually use, um, there we go, uh, single stars to basically get italic text. So that's a little bit on markdown format for you. Um, there is not a whole lot more that you can do with markdown formatting, but if you're curious about what are all the things that you can do, a good place to look at is the help. And then uh, the markdown quick reference will basically pull up this uh, little example document where you can take a look to see what are the various types of uh, formatting things you can do with markdown. We're rarely going to be asking you to do very fancy formatting for your documents. We're going to focus on kind of the your interpretations and also obviously your analysis and your code. Uh, but it's nice to know that these are available. The one last thing that I'd like to show you before we end the demo is that in addition to knitting the entire document, we can also run one code at a time. So let's go ahead, for example, and um, insert a code chunk and say in this code chunk, I want to add two and two together. And if I actually click on this little green button, what I will see is that the code runs and I can see my result here in line. Another option is um, you can actually, if you would like to see that result in the console, you can say, please show me the chunk output in the console. And let's go ahead and do that. And now I can actually see the results uh, here in the console as well. Next, let's return to the notion of your environment and talk about how that interacts with being in an R Markdown document. The thing to keep in mind is that the environment of your R Markdown document is separate from the console. I'd like you to remember this, but I'd also like you to expect it to bite you a few times as you're learning to work with R Markdown. Um, it's going to feel a little bit frustrating initially, but you'll get to hang, you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly, I think. And I'll also say a bit about uh, why this is important. So let me give an example. What we will do is we're going to run the following in the console. So we're basically going to assign the value two to X and then do X times three. We expect to see six. And then what we're going to do is actually to insert just that second line X times three into our R Markdown document and take a look at what happens. So let's go to R and I'm going to type X 
is 2. I can see it in my environment. And x times 3 is 6. All good. x is stored as a value, and I can see that it is. So let's go ahead and now in our R Markdown document, insert a, a new R chunk and say x times 3. And let's go ahead and run this document. I am getting an error when I knit it, and the error says that it has to do with something on line 13, so it tells me where the issue might be. And it says, error in blah, 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 object X not found. Why is object X not found? I can clearly see that X is in my environment, and hence I should, uh, it's a little bit puzzling why it's not found, but it, coming back to that tip that I gave earlier, your environment for what's happening in the console is different than that of the R Markdown document. So if I were to actually assign um, X to two here as well, and knit the document, I should get the result I expected, uh, and that result will be six, and that'll be printed in my um, the output of my R Markdown document. So the reason why this is the case is that your R Markdown document is supposed to be a reproducible document, a fully reproducible document, meaning that if you were to say, email me this document at this particular stage, before you actually added the assignment for X into the document, I wouldn't be able to run it because you're not going to also be able to email me your R environment as well. So we want our code to be entirely complete and reproducible in our R Markdown document. Therefore, it can't actually borrow anything from uh, your global environment. Everything you need has to live in the R Markdown document. Ways in which this might bite you is you might maybe load a data set and you will be able to see it in your environment. Maybe you start playing around with it by typing some code in the console. And then finally, when it comes time to knitting the document, you might see uh, something like, I can't find that object. So this is always the first thing to, thing to try is to look to make sure that whatever object you are trying to use is actually defined in your R Markdown document. If you would like to see more help on uh, our markdown, one of the places to go is the our markdown cheat sheet. And I'll often be referring you to these cheat sheets along the way since they tend to contain very like concise and useful information. And also the markdown quick reference that I displayed to you earlier. And both of these can be accessed from the help menu on our studio. So how are we going to use our markdown in this class? In this class, every assignment, report, project, etc., is going to be in our Markdown document. You'll always have a template our Markdown document to start with, just like you've had in the application exercises so far. But in the application exercises so far, I've given you so much already in the our Markdown document and have asked you to do very little in them. As the semester progresses, I'm going to be taking away some of that scaffolding and you're going to be writing more of the document until when we come to the project where you basically get a blank slate and you need to fill that out yourself. The, um, another thing that I wanted to mention before we uh, kind of wrap up this video is I've been showing all these hex stickers to you. So what's with all the hexes? Um, it is maybe the trend. It's certainly not a rule and not a requirement, but maybe the trend to make a hex sticker for your R package. So a lot of R package developers actually make hex sticker, uh, hex logos for their packages. And then sometimes they'll get them printed out and handed off to each other at like conferences and stuff back when we used to be able to go to conferences in person. Um, and so that's where they come from. I've linked here on this slide to a blog post by Mitchell O'Hara Wild, who made this hex sticker um, in the shape of Australia for USAR 2018. USAR is the annual um, our conference that moves all around the world and it was in Australia that year. So there's actually some R code that would allow you to reproduce this sticker uh, where the stickers are arranged um, it, based on their colors and stuff. So it's a nice read, but I also wanted to give you this context because I'll be showing you these lo logos along the way as well. Okay, 
to wrap things up, I'd like you to set aside the videos and go into our Studio Cloud and start working on the second application exercise. Uh, this is the same document that I was working off of earlier doing the demo. I did the demo and I showed you kind of some of the markdown syntax and how our markdown works in general, but I didn't actually fill in the blanks for you. So now it is your time to open it up, read through it, and then fill in the blanks as well.